Hi everyone, I'm happy to announce that version 1.5 of the modular workspaces add-on is now available and because of this you can get it for 25% off for one week after this video is released. So today we're going to take a look at the new features, I'm going to explain some of the changes and hopefully we can get you up to speed with improving your startup workflow in Blender. So for those of you that are new here, what is the modular workspaces add-on? Well basically, I do a lot of work in Blender, obviously, and one thing I always found myself doing was recreating the same kind of starter scenes or just copying and pasting them over from different files and the introduction of the asset browser, which is a somewhat recent feature in Blender, made it possible to drag and drop in different collections of assets you've created, which is great for building template starting points for your files. The thing is, when you drag in collection assets, they're packaged up, they're not individual objects, and you can unpack them, but you're still kind of left with rearranging them to the right place in the scene, and then afterwards there's some cleanup involved because some of the names might need to be cleaned up, and then you've also got like options for keeping the parent and the hierarchy, and I just wanted a way to like smooth out this process. So what Modular Workspaces lets you do is if you have collection assets, drag in your favorite elements, a bit like Lego. So let's say I want a camera, a light catcher, and study lighting, and press this unpack setup button. It automatically unpacks all of those collection assets into individual objects, and then organizes them into the right kinds of collections based on their type. It also centers it on the world zero, which means that you know that all of those collection assets you've dragged in are perfectly lined up and ready to go. So that's all it takes after you've dragged in all of the assets you like, just one button press will unpack and organize all of them. And you can see that you have the different options here to customize the unpacking process. So you can do the selected only, toggle over to center them when you're unpacking them, organize them into collections, keep the parent and hierarchy structures, and trim dot zero zero one suffixes. Now another thing people really liked about this add-on was the introduction of this asset browser button. And it's a toggle button now. Beforehand, it would only be able to open the asset browser, and you'd have to use the close asset browser button to close it. But now it's a proper toggle. And this is thanks to a community contribution from Dennis, aka Dino Sire, who's actually developed a lot of the interface features we're about to speak about. Basically, over the first couple of months of the year, I was dealing with some medical problems, which you may or may not know about. But during this time, Dennis decided to continue developing a few of my add-on projects just because they wanted to. They were extremely generous in doing this, and I liked a lot of the features they added. I even offered to give them a cut of the profit from this update on modular workspaces, but they turned it down. So they've just done this out of the kindness of their heart. So yeah, you can thank Dennis for this toggle functionality. And the reason why this button exists is because, again, one of the things I don't really like about Blender is having to manually go down and find that perfect spot in the interface, click and drag that up, then click on this drop down, then find the asset browser, and then go and choose my like favorite settings and my favorite asset library to use and then make sure it's perfect. You know, that's just a bit of hassle. So now you can just press that one button and it opens up. And before as well, we had a separate button for setting the asset browser to your favorite settings. For example, the size of the thumbnails or what asset library you had active. Um, but now again, thanks to Dennis, your favorite settings for the asset browser, which you can define in the add-on panel, now automatically apply when you use the asset browser button. So you press that and it's just right there your favorite asset library and your favorite thumbnail size. So that's really great for convenience. Just open and close, open and close, all right there immediately. So again, let's just do a quick demonstration of that. I'm in an empty blend file, asset browser, diorama, unpack, there we go. And that's like my scene ready. That was like about what, a one to two second process. So modular workspaces comes with this asset library. It's my library of official content. Um, but of course, you don't have to use this asset library to make use of the add-on features. The unpacking works on any collection asset. So if you make your own series of collection assets, to build up your own starter files with Blender. They don't even have to be starter files. It can just be if you have complex templates of the collections you want to bring in, that's fine. But I've made this here just in case you want a helping hand from me. So I have made some changes to the asset library from previous versions, but before we do that, we're going to talk about one more new section to the add-on. You'll see that we now have these areas bottom area, right area, top and left area. So now, again, thanks to Dennis, we can create custom buttons, which are again toggle buttons in the 3D view, much like the asset browser one. And you can also disable the asset browser button now if you like. So this means that for any side of the 3D view, you can now have your own toggleable editors. Now, one thing I will say about this feature, is that the Blender Python API for opening and closing different editor windows is a bit finicky. It's a bit weird. So consider this an experimental feature and it might not behave exactly how you want it to. I'll try and explain. Let's add a button for the top area and I'll leave it on timeline. So if we press that, we'll get the timeline coming down and we can close it again. That's perfectly good. We like that. It means that say if you're like, you know, trying to preview an animation in a scene and you just want to be in like a full screen mode where you've only got the 3D view active and you just want to be able to quickly scrub through the timeline you can do that. And again, say you think the timeline comes down too far, we can change that so the top area size percentage is only like, what, 10% instead? So then when we press the button, the timeline's a lot smaller.
cooler. That's really cool. But things get a little bit weird. Say if we did like a left area button and let's make it something like the shader editor, which I already have active. I'll rename the button as well. So what we are expecting is a shader editor to open on the left. But we noticed that when we pressed it, the properties on the right disappeared. And now if I press it again, the shader editor closed on the left, one that was already open. So it's now closed two different panels. And then if I press it again, the world nodes closed. And now if I press it again, the shader editor has reopened. There is probably a way to solve this, but it's just because again, the Python API for opening and closing windows is a bit weird. So when it comes to using these custom button features, my suggestion would be only really use it if you're the kind of person that likes a minimalist interface. And again, maybe for something like I'm imagining architectural visualization, maybe with animated elements, and you just want these things which you can quickly open and close from your minimalist perspective. Say you really wanted a lightweight view like this, we could set the outliner again maybe to something like 10 and then have the outliner as a toggle. That works perfectly fine, again with the timeline as well. So you can see that this feature for these toggle buttons is actually really nice. It's a different way of using Blender. We can just turn the things on and off as we go in the 3D view and keep things kind of maximized for our space. Now one more weird quirky thing to note about opening editor windows is that if the area size percentage is larger than 50 I believe then it will instead flip to the other side. Again weird API. So notice if I make the area percentage size something larger than 50 it now appears on the right instead. I don't know why it's like that. Anyway, I'm sure some of you will find this custom button system useful. Remember to consider it experimental. So like I said, new content has been added to the asset library that comes with modular workspaces, and a few changes have been made to some of the previous collection assets. First of all, let's take a look at the light catcher. The light catcher is something I use a lot in my work, especially recently. When I'm doing these diorama scenes where I'm working on different like material effects, you'll see a lot in my videos that I'm basically having a scene with a subject and this light catcher object going up behind it. One thing I learned recently while doing the semi-procedural material workflow test with the clay, you might have seen this video, is that darker backgrounds are really good for kind of accentuating the subject and when working with cycles darker backgrounds also don't reflect too much light back into the scene. Anyway, where am I going with this? If I unpack the light catcher and also again bring the camera back in and I will bring in the study lighting which is a new lighting preset, then you can see the light catcher has now been made dark by default instead of bright and it also comes with a default sphere here which is good for testing different lighting setups. Now as I just mentioned, the study lighting preset is a new one and it's one that I again was using with this semi-procedural clay demonstration. If I delete those lights we can bring in the studio lighting which existed in the package before but I've kind of balanced it a bit more so it's like light is coming from both directions. This is good for like product visualization type work and then we have some other demonstrations for example it might be easier if I go to the lighting category in the asset library. We have like the three point lighting setup and likewise we have the moody lights. So this light catcher scene is really good for experimenting with different lighting presets and for seeing how the lights affect the subject in the scene. Now again, just to note there about the asset library that comes with modular workspaces, which is just called modular workspaces library, all of the content has already been packaged into unique categories. When I organized the assets into categories with the last version, people were a bit confused of how to actually install the asset library. Basically, when you download the zip file, modular workspaces library, just unpack that somewhere on your computer, then in your edit preferences file paths, go to asset libraries, and you can add the library, give it the name, point the path to wherever you unpacked it. There is a text file inside of the asset libraries and that text file basically describes the categories. The categories will not persist if you drag that text file into another library, that's not how it works. If you want to have the categories as they are, you have to use them inside of the asset library. Okay, so the light catcher is really fun. I've been playing with it for, again, making these new lighting setups, but there's more. So I press the clear file button here. This is a quick way to get rid of all the stuff in your 3D scene. Uh, the diorama collection is all of my favorite starter collection assets in one. So if I drag that in, press unpack, you can see that we have the camera, the light catcher, the study lighting setup, and a default cube. A much more impressive default cube than the traditional one. It has beveled edges. Mm. So before the diorama was just an object to help me like scale the scenes, but now it's all of these things in one. So that's like a proper shortcut for me to get to my favorite setup in one drag of an asset and one press of a button. So that change has been made. Also, if I delete this object, we have a new color chart collection asset. If I drag that in and unpack it, we have a Macbeth color color chart, a matte sphere, and a reflective sphere. So this is good for people that are playing around with different color spaces and view transforms or doing compositing and want to calibrate things between different scenes. For example, you can see here, if I go to my color management view transform and change between standard and filmic, the accurate hexadecimal values for the colors is represented differently depending on what view transform you're using. And also on the matte sphere, you can see a good representation of how the white colors of bright light are more blown out. Whereas if we go back to filmic, you can see how it's much more controlled. So again, like I said, these are 
accurate color values, but keep in mind that different things are going to modify the look of the color in a 3D scene, especially the material properties. But if you go to the uh, material list, you can see from one to 24, you have the accurate colors there. So some people might appreciate this if they're trying to be really careful with how light and color is represented in their scenes. In addition to this, I've taken out the shader sphere, which was just a sphere and replaced it with a shader slab object. So these are custom objects I actually made back in December 2021, I think, that I never got around to using. And there are a couple of mostly hard surface shader test objects, which have my logo ident on them. So there are curved sections to them and like harder surface, tighter angles. So again, the purpose of these is to test materials on when developing materials. So maybe for example, if I go to some of my own materials, let me try this ambient grunge material on the right one. So there we go. You can see how it's dynamically adapting to the ambient occlusion and trying to add grunge around the object. Maybe for the left slab, I'll go to my modular metals package, maybe find the complex iron, but reduce the age and modify the roughness until we get something that we like. And then we have like quite a Star Warsian distribution of materials here. And then we can look around, zoom into them because these are procedural materials. You can see like the seemingly infinite detail on them. So these shader slabs are available for you to experiment with as well now. Basically, as you can see, the combination of modular workspaces and this asset library is all about getting you to a good workable starting point in Blender in just a couple of mouse strokes. And also again, with these extra features, giving you a bit more control over the interface, some nice usability features. So for a couple more things, if you have a keen eye, you'll notice that my interface theme for Blender is a bit different. I've come up with a new theme called Steel. It's darker than the base Blender dark theme. And also some of the colors for different nodes have been changed. There's some like very slight grayish blue highlights to the interface. If we go to the scripting view, you can see got like blue comments. It's all supposed to be a bit more steely. Very faint blues on the backgrounds here. Um, I liked it. It felt kind of more professional and clean. And also I have a new startup file to go along with this, which you can see here. Uh, so these two things, the theme and the startup file are available for free on my Kurt's defaults Gumroad page, but also the startup file has been prepackaged inside of the modular workspaces package. So that's easily accessible for people that have picked up the add-on. I noticed there are a few other things I forgot to mention. So for example, there's a view tunnel collection, which I think was added between versions. And this by default actually gives you like an underwater effect. The view tunnel is an object where you can apply a kind of transparent shader to it of a different style. What it lets you do is visualize objects inside of that view tunnel as if they're kind of inside of a medium. So in this case, we have Suzanne underwater. I don't know if I actually mentioned this in a previous video. This effect actually comes from Chris Bettini. Now, one thing to keep in mind about the view tunnel though, is that if you're gonna use it, you wanna make sure that you're keeping the parent structure when importing the view tunnel. This will mean that when you move the camera around, the view tunnel camera, the tunnel actually moves with it. So basically if I fly around now, it looks like we are underwater. So that was another little tool that was added to the asset library that I'm not sure if I remember to mention. And again, this also gives you a good starting point for designing your own like spatial medium effects. Everything is customizable in the shader editor. Also in a previous large update for modular workspaces, I added character displays. I recommend checking out that video to learn more, but basically I did a collection of artistic displays, which if you drag them into your scene are complex artistic setups to let you visualize characters inside of a well-lit scene. There are different camera angles you can use, I don't have a character model with me at the moment, but I'll probably show something on the screen. You can see what it looks like. But these also come with volume presets, which you can drag into the world nodes. And this gives you more artistic control over the scattering of light for those character displays. And while we're talking about that, again, one thing I forgot to mention, for those of you that are new to the modular workspaces product, is that we also have world nodes. So for example, if you're starting from scratch and you want like a high altitude scene, you can drag that in and attach that to the surface. And it looks like you're in the sky. We also have things like gradient backgrounds. So if you want to create like a procedural backdrop for your scene, you can do that and it affects the uh, lighting on the object as well. Then one of my favorite nodes is the HDRI and color background one, which you can see here. And this basically lets you separate what light is affecting the object from what light is displayed as the background. So for example, we can plug in an HDRI to act on the object and we have the strength there, but then we can also separately change the background color. So for those of you that like using HDRIs, but you don't want to see the HDRI as the background, then this node is good for you because it helps you to make that separation. There's also a more simple separate background node here, which does the same thing, but just gives you two options. So yes, if you have found this interesting, then consider picking up a copy of Modular Workspaces. There are lots of possibilities for things you can create with it. Again, I think this will be really powerful for users that want to make their own collection assets as modular pieces to help build up their workflow. Again, one thing I just want to say before I close this up is that though I'm not trying to get sympathy points, this year has been quite difficult for again, like the medical reasons explained. I'm very lucky that people like Dennis have been available to help me like continue developing projects like this while all that's been going on. But also YouTube doesn't really pay much. So all of 
the content that you've been experiencing, enjoying all of the community projects we've been doing, Blendstream, the community roundups, they largely rely on the sales of products like this and on patrons. So what I'm trying to say is I very much appreciate you picking up a copy of the add-on. Of course, like I said, there's a discount going on at the moment for one week, mod 15 at checkout if you want to take advantage of that. And I have enabled purchasing power parity on Gumroad as well, because I know that some of you live in parts of the world where it's actually quite difficult to get the resources to purchase add-ons like this. So Gumroad came out with a new feature recently where it checks information every week against the World Bank. And if you live in a part of the world where the cost of living is drastically different, then you may already be entitled to discounts which are applied automatically on my products. So head on over to the product page, check out the discount, maybe take a look at it without the discount as well, see what the page says because you may already be entitled to a discount. Um, so just take a look and you can probably get some money off. But yeah, hopefully you have developed something interesting enough that you can get some value back and you'll actually find this useful. And of course, massive thank you to our patrons at patreon.com slash Curtis Holt. You can see their lovely names here on the Hall of Patrons. Although this piece of artwork that we've done is a permanent project. So when you sign up as a patron, you get your name put on this artwork permanently. So we have new people coming in. Some old people have unsubscribed from the patron, but their names are still up there. I wanted to do a bit like that. You know that thing they do with like Epcot at Disney, where you walk in and you've got like all these names and faces on like this big like historical record almost. I thought something like that would be cool. I might change it in the future, but you know, you can get your name put up there if you sign up. And that also helps to support, again, all the projects. So yeah, thanks again. Have a great day, everyone. Oh, and if you made it this far, put a, well, it's Easter today. So put like a bunny emoji in the comments. If you're on Windows, press the Windows key and the period key and you can get an emoji keyboard. And if you put that emoji in the comments, I'll be able to see which of you made it this far. Yeah, thanks everyone. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.